Welcome to week 13. I'm Amber Cameron. And I'm Zach. And Zach, I, I just want to touch base real quick before we move into today's lesson. Last week, you uh, went through the passage about the Levite and the idols. And as we get to the end, we find out that this Levite is related to Moses. Of all people. Of all people. Talk a little bit about that, because that, that can be a surprise. And the author of Judges brings in this story that ends up being a part of the beginning. And one of the mm -hmm. things as we get even, even into the next couple chapters is we get other generational links that drag mm -hmm. people back into the very beginning of the story. And so from the beginning, we have this notion that the people went into the land. God had given them all these commands to keep them, uh, uh, to, to protect them, right, from, from idolatry and the Canaanites. And it, did, it just didn't yeah, take like long. Very quickly, yeah. And in particular, uh, about a Levite. And so as we look in today, mm -hmm. we get to explore a story about another Levite and the continued downward spiral of God's people. In Jesus' name, right. amen. A number of years ago, uh, about a year after my wife and I moved to Mexico, we were asked to staff a discipleship training school. And uh, in this school, we had 50, 60 students from all over the country, the 18 to 25-ish range mostly, come in for, uh, for a, f a couple of months, a few months. They would uh, go through training, lecture phase, and then they would do outreach. And so we were part of the staff for this. And one of the things about this school that was different from any other school I'd been a part of is in the back of the, of the room in which the lecture was happening, there were some parents who had small children that were not yet walking, but that were gooing and gone, just making sounds during the teaching. And in my impatience, and dare I say childlessness, I would think to myself, how in the world could they let that interrupt that? And I complained on multiple occasions to make my voice heard. Then years later, I had kids and something happened. You see, I started to not hear it anymore because children make noise and that noise eventually turns into dadas. And something happened in my brain over the course of a few years in which when the dada, dada, dada began, my ears knew what was happening, but my brain would refuse to register it. Such that sometimes, and I know some of you can relate, it would take four, five, 10, 20 times before you're like, oh yeah, you're talking to me. Because what happens is the noise, the cries of our little ones, for many of us, kind of fade into the background. It just becomes background noise. One of the hard things about the book of Judges is that for the people of God, as they entered into the land, it captures for them what has been the fading of the law into background noise. And as the law had faded, God's cries to his people, God's call to his people, and I know I'm kind of comparing the cries of your children to the law, but not so much. I hope you get where I'm going with this. But that God's call to his people to live the kind of life they were designed for faded over time. And as it did so, the sin that he warned them against became more and more tolerable. God's commands became background noise and sin became tolerable. What we're going to do this morning is we read a story of what seems like a particularly heinous sin, a particularly heinous, wicked, terrible. Many of us respond to this, I'm sure, with, with deep, emotional, vehement, just, just visceral responses towards this text. But as we go into this, one of, uh, one of my hopes is that we actually get a glimpse in our response towards this story, we get a glimpse of God's heart towards sin. I'm going to begin. I'm going to read through it, paraphrase some, and offer some comments. And then I have three points for us to consider as we go through the text. Judges 19.1, if you're not there already. In those days when there was no king in Israel, a Levite staying in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. Now there's no name. There's no name for the Levite. There's no name for the woman. They're just referred to as the Levite and the concubine. And one of the literary devices used here and in other parts of scripture is a nameless character is often representative of a far greater and widespread issue. 
And so in this particular case, we have the Levite who's supposed to be a set apart amongst the people set apart. Obviously not so much. We have a concubine who in everything that she endures is representing a far per more pervasive issue in their time. The people finding themselves marginalized, oppressed, abused. Now what happens in this story is she flees. And some of your texts actually say that she was angry. And some of your texts say that she played the harlot. She prostituted herself. She was unfaithful. And part of the reasoning in there is that when the Jewish scholars came in a little bit before Jesus and translated the Hebrew into the Greek, they took that word to be unfaithful and they saw her act not as actually a, a, a sexual adultery, but they saw the leaving of him as the act of unfaithfulness. And so they translated that as she had become angry with him. That's why we have those two different things pop up. And so the man goes and he gets her and her father's very hospitable. He just wants to keep them there. I would think for many of us, if someone were hosting us for days and days, or if you were hosting your in-laws for days and days, at some point you'd be like, when are they going to leave? He just wants to keep them there. But nonetheless, they go. And on their way back, the Levite servant points out, hey, there's Jerusalem, the Jebusites. But the Levite says, no, 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 no. We're going to keep going and stay with our own people. In his mind, he didn't want to stay with people, the people of Canaan. But little did he know he would end up staying with his own people that had by this point become Canaanized. And so staying with someone who finally welcomed them in as they arrived in Gibeah, we pick up in verse 22. I want to read this text because it's heavy. It's heavy. While they were enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, wicked men of the city surrounded the house and beat on the door. They said to the old man who was the owner of the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. This is reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that God's chosen people set apart had become Sodom and Gomorrah. The owner of the house went out and said, please don't do this evil, my brothers. After all, this man has come into my house. Do not commit this horrible outrage here. Let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine now. Abuse them. Do whatever you want to them. But don't commit this outrageous thing against this man. We see in this culture something that prizes hospitality and particularly the honor of men so much that they're willing to give up anything, including the shame or life of the women close to them for it. We have God's heart for hospitality broken and fractured by sin and culture. But the men would not listen, and so the man seized his concubine, he took her outside, they raped her and abused her all night until morning, and at daybreak they let her go. Early that morning, the woman made her way back, and as it was getting light, she collapsed at the doorway of the man's house where her master was. And when her master got up in the morning, opened the doors of the house, and went out to leave on his journey, there was the woman, his concubine, collapsed near the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, let's go put her on his donkey and set out for home. You can imagine picking up like a sack of potatoes and just throwing her up on the horse. He proceeds to cut her into 12 pieces and mail her out. And then finally, in Judges 24 through 7, when presenting his case to Israel, summoning God's people together to render a verdict against the people of Gibeah, we see in verse 5, he says, They came to attack me and surrounded the house at night. They intended to kill me, but they raped my concubine, and she died. What little there might be, very, very little, to reserve any sort of opinion for this Levite is stripped out in him making himself the victim in this whole scenario. What do we do with a passage like this? Why is it here? Why does God's word include such a graphic story? And why is it so hard? I think many of us in different ways see ourselves in the story, both as villain and for some of us as the victim. For some of us, this is in part our story. I looked up some scary statistics this week in 2010, 85,000 forcible rapes were reported in our nation. In 
2017, 18% of women surveyed reported having been raped, 44% having been sexually victimized in a way other than rape. In a compilation of statewide data, it's estimated that roughly half a million people a year are victims of sexual assault. That's men and women. In one survey of 44 rape survivors, 100%, 100% of those interviewed reported feelings in the weeks and months after the event reported feeling sadness, anxiety, revengeful feeling, difficulty sleeping, terrifying dreams. They avoided people, feelings of, of a refeeling of, of being raped, feelings of intense fear, stigma, and bitterness. This is one of the most invasive, if not the most invasive, selfish, violent acts against God's design for relationships and sex. The pain and hurt is for many too hard to describe. It doesn't, it's not merely an attack on the body, but as I've heard some say, it feels like an attack on the soul. And there's no doubt women hearing this who've been there. And you read this story and perhaps cry out, where's God? Why is this here? As we encounter this story, we have to be reminded that sin creates real victims. That selfishness leads to real hurt. We forget in kind of the big overview picture of God's people in Israel that there were real individuals turned into victims as more and more people decided to do what was right in their own eyes. But this is just, isn't just a story about rape and abuse. It's a story about sin. And that's why it's hard, because this is one story in a stack of stories layered in the selfish desires of humanity to do whatever they want and to get whatever they want. In our disgust of this story, we need to be reminded of the disgustingness of sin. John Piper defined sin in what I feel like is one of the most comprehensive approaches. He wrote this, what is sin? It is the glory of God not honored, the holiness of God not reverenced, the greatness of God not admired, the power of God not praised, the truth of God not sought, the wisdom of God not esteemed, the beauty of God not treasured, the goodness of God not savored, the faithfulness of God not trusted. It is the commandments of God not obeyed, the justice of God not respected, the wrath of God not feared, the grace of God not cherished, the presence of God not prized, the person of God not loved, that is sin. And as we encounter a story like this, one of the first things I wanna challenge us this morning to take away from this is we cannot become desensitized to sin. The problem is the law fades into the background for the people of Israel is that sin becomes tolerable. As the law fades, as the commands fade, sin becomes tolerable. And it begins with a small thing that lives in your home with you and it grows and it grows and the ripple effects stretch and they stretch. And for many of us, it takes a story like this to actually get us angry and upset. How in the world could this happen? We have to be shocked by a story like this into a glimpse of the holy anger and sadness that God feels towards sin period. But please don't hear what I'm not saying. And this was hanging in the back of my mind as I was thinking about this this week. I am not going to compare and say that rape and abuse and murder is the same in our world as what we would consider in the West tolerable sins. So please don't hear that. But one of our problems and one of the problems of God's people is that they lived in a world full of tolerable sin. For us, it looks different. We live in a world full of tolerable sins. In fact, if you grew up in a Western evangelical church, you probably know what the tolerable sins are. You we know that we're not supposed to covet. And yet it's so easy for Pinterest or Instagram or YouTube or Ikea.com to be the door that we walk through in order to feed that well-hidden beast, that beast that destroys our contentment known as coveting. We know God calls us to be hospitable and to be generous, but as that fades into the background, it's just easy to just not do so and to hide it well. We know that pride for many is a tolerable sin. This idea of 
not being willing to share what's going on in your life, the, the rejection of confession, the unwillingness to be vulnerable, perhaps masking it in quiet strength. Gluttony, the replacement of God and his comfort and his pleasure with food. It's a tolerable sin. The list goes on and on and on. And we allow these little things in our life to creep in and to slowly remove God from the throne of our heart and to take his place instead. And we become desensitized to the effect of sin in our life. And every now and again, and I've been here, maybe some of you have been here too, where somebody gets a prompting of the Holy Spirit and they're like, ooh, we got to make this change. You know, maybe I shouldn't be watching that show or maybe I need to stop buying this or maybe I need to delete this off of my phone and you go to a friend. Maybe this person comes to you and they share and you're like, oh, like if what you're saying is true, that means I got to change too. So don't feel so bad. And we almost convince people, like don't feel bad about it. I know the Holy Spirit is telling you to change, but you don't feel bad because you feel bad that I got to feel bad too. And we start to weaponize God's grace against sanctification. Grace, grace, grace. When the Spirit is prompting a change. And then we come to a story like this in the book of Judges. And we see the shock of where sin ultimately leads. And we experience viscerally in our hearts and in our minds what I believe God's posture as a holy and perfect God is towards the rebellion of his people. Don't become desensitized to sin. Our second reflection as we look through this story is that the law while given to guide God's people wasn't enough to change people's hearts. Think about last week and think about this week. Who were our main characters? The Levites, right? And God, Israel was meant to be set apart from the world to be different. And among the people of Israel, the Levites were set apart to be different. And of course, the main characters of these stories are the Levites. Now, one of the interesting things is it says at the very beginning of this chapter, the Levite took a concubine. Now, in Leviticus chapter 18, it tells men that they're not to take, the, they're, they're not to take as a wife uh, uh, any sister of their current wife. Now, some people read that and they think to themselves, well, I'm not allowed to marry their biological sister. But every other time that phrase occurs in Scripture, it actually doesn't refer to the biological sister. It refers to everyone else in the category. Which is why that during Jesus' time, the Jewish people at Qumran, in a commentary on that verse in Leviticus, said that men were never supposed to take more than one wife. We see this reinforced in Deuteronomy when it says, the king shall not have many wives. And yet here it is, the Levite, the one who is to be set apart amongst the people set apart, is the one taking a concubine. The law didn't change people's hearts and the law couldn't fully set people apart. Then why was the law given? Well, Galatians gives us actually a glimpse into that. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse because it is written, Everyone who does not do everything in the book of the law is cursed. Now it is clear that no one is justified by the law because the righteous will live by faith. Going on to verse 19. Why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. Down to verse 24. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. Why was the law given? To show us our need for a savior, to limit the injustice in the world, and to protect us in part from our own transgressions. But it didn't change hearts. And we actually learn a little bit later that this story, just like last week, happened not too long after they entered the land. They hadn't had a lot of time for Canaan to come in and do their thing amongst the people. And while God gave them boundaries of love for, for their greatest benefit, for their greatest good, for his greatest glory, that they quickly passed out through those boundaries, doing their own thing. The law couldn't change Hearts, And as we read a story like this with the Levite as its main character, we have to realize that it takes something far, far more than just the law. Ultimately, it points us to our need for a savior. The book of Galatians should constantly point us to our need for Jesus. Jesus. 
And it's Jesus who says in John that there is no love greater than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. I say this because my third reflection this morning, my final reflection, is that Jesus treats his bride different. As we read through this story, as we walk through the gruesomeness of this text, that you and me have the benefit of living in a post-Jesus world. Because Jesus, when he talks about love, said that there's no love greater than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. And in Ephesians, in Ephesians we see Paul talk about love. And we see Paul talk about a man and his wife and what that relationship's supposed to look like. Because a concubine was a wife. A concubine was a second-class wife. A concubine didn't share in the inheritance, but was often brought in in order to produce additional children. So the, she, didn't, she didn't threaten the inheritance of others in the family, but she could produce heirs. And in Ephesians, we see what it is that a man is supposed to do in his treatment of his wife. People get stuck on the submission language in Ephesians because it says submit to one another. And then it says women submit to your husbands. But then what does it say to the men? This is where the men screw up. Over the years, what does it say to the men? I would say is, is quite challenging of a command. It basically says be Jesus. Give yourself sacrificially for your wife that she may be presented holy and set apart before God. And then we end up in this story with that as our backdrop, with that as God's design for love and relationships, we end up in this story where the Levite has to choose. He has a choice to make. And there's men outside in this town that he's traveled to and they're asking for him and they want him. They want to sodomize and brutalize him. And he knows that if he goes out that door that he will face violence, he will face danger, that bets are off and there are no guarantees. And so looking at his concubine and thinking, it's either me or you, he grabs her and he pushes her out the door. Take her. Have your way. Just leave me be. He purchases his own safety and security with her abuse. He purchases his own life with her shame. He purchases a good night's rest with her life. Take her. Take her. I know some here have felt cast aside in life. Some of you have experienced neglect. Some of you know what it is to be trampled over by the self-serving interests of others and perhaps at some point a spouse. But Jesus treats his bride different. And over a thousand years later, the very God forgotten in this chapter because God isn't looked to in this chapter would take on flesh for the very people who had forgotten him. He would live the perfect life that they couldn't. And in the final hours of Jesus' life, he would face a decision. If his bride was to live, he would have to die. And in the stress of those moments with sweat like blood, he asked his father in heaven if the cup could pass from him. But nonetheless said, your will be done. The Levite said, take her that I might live. And Jesus said, take me that she might live. That you might live. Jesus knew you in all of your mess, your mistakes, your baggage, your brokenness, the terrible things you've done, the shameful things you've thought, the people you've hurt, the loved ones you've betrayed, all harm done by you and to you. He knew it in those moments. And he said, take me, not her. As we wrestle through the text in the book of Judges and we see the acts of the Levite, we have to be pointed in the depths of that darkness to the beauty of what it is Christ was actually willing to do. And this chapter does confront us with the brutality of human sinfulness. But in that brutality, we do get to see the beauty of our Savior.
We see the shortcomings of the law, but we see the sufficiency ultimately of Christ. And because of where we stand, we get to see it against the backdrop of what Jesus was willing to do for us. And so I encourage you to let the weight of the chapter sit. There wasn't a lot of levity here. We often insert that. But this is a chapter that just needs to be felt. May we understand what it is that sin does to the world. And may we see in this our desperate need for a savior.